All right, the theme that we've had so far has been learning about the different ASP.NET controls and most importantly, learning how we can program with them, or how we can get them to do what it is we want to do. Um, we're going to pick up on the quiz example we had from last time, and we're going to extend it by adding different controls and validation and a lot of the other things. Kind of a survey of all these things um, that you can do via the ASP.NET controls and sort of a maybe a review of C Sharp stuff. So we'll go from there. I do apologize for any trauma that I caused last week by mentioning the species of a certain well-loved <laughs> cartoon character. Apology not accepted. Okay. Oh, boy. Wait you get your grades. Yeah. Wait I get my evaluation. It'll be a, it's like they're anonymous, but like. We know it is. Let's see. It'll be like. <laughs> the, 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 yeah, they're anonymous, but it's like, I don't care what he says. Hello Kitty is a cat. It'll be like, gee, I, I wonder who that's to, from. I dare you to put yeah, that would be great. Okay. I'll yeah, do please do. All right. Let's see. All right, here we go. We'll spend a minute reviewing this. <clears throat> One thing, on occasion, I will get emails from people saying that they're not able to run their application, like after they closed it and got out of it. And what I think the issue is, uh, in many of the cases, is they're not opening it up correctly. So let's review how you open it up. I talked about last time how creating an app, you um, go into File, New, Website, and that's the way to create the app, not how maybe you've done it in the C Sharp classes where you create a project or something like that. It's most straightforward just to go in and create a website like that. Um, the... Uh, then the flip side is, is after you have created it, to go back in and open it. So let's take a look at how you do that. So I have on the desktop a folder that is named Quiz. And I'm going to put that inside another folder called Lab, for lack of a better word. The only reason I'm doing that is because it, it, this is useful in demonstrating the issue that a lot of people have. All right, So you don't have to do that, but this is what people run into. So if they go in and open it, File, Open, Website is the way to open it. Then you want to pick the folder that has the config file in it. So in other words, <coughs> Don't pick the folder above the folder that has a config file. So if I pick this folder, what will happen is it will look like it will open it correctly, <clears throat> but when I go to run it, it's going to blow up. I think. I stand corrected. Sometimes it can blow up. All right. What you want to do is you want to open the folder that um, the actual website is in. So by that I mean the one that contains the web config. So I will go and open that and now I'm in better shape. Alright, so 
use that method to open the pages and you'll be better off. All right. If you recall from last time, what we had is we had sort of a one question quiz where we had a button to submit the answers. We had a question and what I wanted to do is I want to add a, uh, a, a hint to this. All right, and I want to add some validation. I think that's where we left off last time. There's no validation and there's no hint. So let's go and let's add those two things. Now, I mentioned before that probably a good way to do this would be via a panel. And the reason for that is because there's a chance that you would have more than one thing. All right. Let's go and use this picture. All right. I'm going to put that in a folder inside of here called images. Remember, everything that you learned in standard web development still applies here, right? So it's good to have organized, um, it's good to organize your files into their folders, <coughs> all right? So the other thing that I've said is it's good to go in and make sure your file extensions are turned on so I can see exactly what that file extension is, all right? Remember that, you know, files could be JPEGs, they could be PNGs, and even with JPEGs, there's a number of different extensions that a file can have. A file can be JPEG or JPG, so it is good to, to make sure those on. So, we go back into Visual Studio. I am going to refresh so that I can see the images folder, and then I'm going to create a panel that will be my hint panel. And I can do this again, either graphically or I can do it through the code. Like I said, it's good to be sort of fluent in both ways of doing it. That way, you know, some things it's easier to do with the code. Some things it's easier to do graphically. So be familiar both ways. So I'm going to go, I'm going to grab a panel. And I'm going to put it there. All right. And inside that panel, I'm going to put an image. Maybe. Pardon me? If I'm wrong, is it going to show Nixon? <laughs> no. This, this is a no politics zone. <laughs> I, like every other human, have my own views and my own opinions, but. I will consider myself successful if you don't have a clue what any of them are, based on what I say in class. We're here talking about programming, no, not politics. Well, both of them make you bang your head against the wall, so. Well, that's true. Programming is a more fun banging the head, though, I would true. say. Because there's always a positive outcome. No, there's not always a positive outcome. <laughs> There's a potential for a positive outcome. All right, let me go in here and put in the image URL. And I'm going to go in and I'm going to pick that image. All right. <coughs> then I'm going to put, you see, here's where in my mind, even, even just naturally, I'm going to switch between the modes because it just is, it makes sense for me to do it that way. I mean, it's hard for me to explain. You'll find your own sort of 
um, technique, but yeah, I'm going to pop into source mode. Yes. Now you said that if, let's say I had a folder completely dedicated to images on my computer. Yes. Now you said that if I were to select an image out of there, it will not automatically create a folder within. That's correct. If I have to. Physically you have to go and make it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. If you know, yeah, that's why I went and created the images folder and so on. Just make sure it doesn't say like right. halfway to it. No. Okay. Let's look at. Let's look at the image tag that it created, or I shouldn't say image tag, the ASP.NET control for image, which is going to translate to an image tag. And the image URL is a little different than what you have seen so far. It's a tilde, that's what the little wiggly line is, tilde slash <laughs> uh, images slash nixon.jpg. All right. What do you suppose the tilde means? Not really a wild card. The root directory of this application. So in other words, this is saying start from the root of this application wherever that may be. Then go down to a folder called images and go down to a folder called Nixon. I'm sorry, go down and, and grab the, the picture of Nixon. <clears throat> now, um, there's other ways you could do it. I could just put images slash nixon.jpg and it would work just as well because that's saying, hey, the folder that this guy's in, there's a folder underneath that called images and that would work just as well. All right. This has the advantage of being able to move this around and, and uh, you know, putting it, when you put it up on a server, it's liable to be in a different physical folder, but you won't get any errors. You will notice this here, and you'll notice this um, when we get to database connections. You should never have a full physical path name to a file or to a database. In other words, you should never see C colon slash program file slash user slash mzeller slash something like that. You should never see that because as soon as you go and move it somewhere else, as soon as you turn it in and I try to run it on my machine, it's going to explode uh, because I don't have the same directory structure that you do. All right, so um, make sure you're using these what are called relative re uh, references. This is relative to the root folder of the application. Now I'm going to go in and I'm going to put in a little paragraph and just to say, This guy was president. Probably should capitalize president, right? I don't know. All right. Now, again, why put these in a panel? Would I have to put it in a panel? No. Why do I put it in a panel, though? So you can set the visibility. So I can set the, the visibility of all these things at one time. All right? Because I could set the visibility of the image and the text and whatever. But this hint, I want to either show the whole thing or hide the whole thing. So I'm going to put in a, um, a um, uh, put it in a panel so I have a, a, a tighter control over that. <clears throat> so I'm going to go in for that panel and I'm going to set the initial visibility False. I'm going to give this a meaningful name, panel hint one, so when I look at my code I don't have to memorize what panel one is and so on down the line. Then I'm going to go in and make a button here to say show hint. And I'll call that button hint one. So there's a very straightforward, um, very straightforward association between the names. Anything you can do to make it easy on yourself.
by all means do, all right? Because um, I'm going to show you a graph I end up eventually talking about in all my classes, all right? And it's the graph of how <coughs> the cost to make a change to a piece of software changes depending on where you find the problem and need to make the change. <clears throat> the graph looks like this. The graph looks like Nixon. No. The graph looks like this. And this is a cost as expressed in hours or money or whatever. All right? Time is money, as they say. And this is a stage of the project that the error is caught. So, like, you have analysis, design, build, test, implementation, maintenance. These are typically the, even if you use another methodology of software development, you kind of have these phases. Like there, I don't know any of you that have studied software methodology, there's what's called the waterfall approach where you try to do everything all at once in one swoop of sequential steps. Then you have a more iterative approach, which is sort of a more modern sort of software development cycle, where you, you, you plan a little bit, do a little bit, test a little bit, implement a little bit. Plan a little bit, do, you know, and, and, and you just keep doing cycles until you're done with everything. Now the point is, is this graph, for you math fans out here, has a positive uh, first derivative, all right? What does that mean? It means it's not simply increasing it's increasing and increasing at a faster rate. So if it was just a linear, another way to say this is a geometric increase. If it was just a linear <coughs> increase, it would be a straight line. Like maybe the cost would be twice as much here as here, four times as much, and so on. Whereas here, it starts to snowball, and the cost really starts to increase. Now. There's nothing that we can do to change the shape of this graph. But what we can do is flatten it out a little bit by using good software development practices. And again, why is this the case? This is a case from the first day that software was created, and it's true now. Well, for the same reason that it's easier to go, who's talking? Oh, sorry. S Siri or sorry? Yeah. Um, for the same reason that it's easier to go in and, and add a room when you're planning a house than after you have the house built, right? If you're still planning a house and it's in, you know, and you have sketches of, uh, of what it's going to look like and all that, it's easier to go and make an addition to it than if your family is already living in it. There's a greater cost, a greater difficulty to you to go in and to make that change, all right, after it's been implemented. So we will um, try our best to flatten that curve out. How do we flatten that curve out? We flatten our curve, that curve out by following good practices in software development. Almost every practice that someone would say that's a good software development practice or is part of best practices, almost every practice like that that we define is because it makes it easier to go back and change it. Why? Because change is inevitable. Now I'm talking about this as though I'm talking about fixing a problem. And that's one aspect of maintenance, but also making enhancements or adding on to it or extending the functionality of a piece of software falls into this as well. By the way, if I'm not mistaken, <coughs> uh, at least according to Facebook, which we know could not possibly be wrong, all right? Actually, it is a very reliable friend of mine, so I do trust this. Um, the first computer bug ever was detected today in, I think, 1947. And it was actually a bug. It was actually like a moth that, like, that like crawled in somewhere and shorted something out. And does anyone know the name of the person that detected this bug? 1947. It was not Richard Nixon, by the way. No. It was not, and it was not Al Gore either. 
Pardon me? No. Grace Hopper. Oh, come on. Oh, Captain okay. Grace Hopper, yes, uh, who was the creator of COBOL and one of the earliest computer programmers. So Captain he Grace. Googled it. I shot yeah, it. I, he I know like he Google did. It. I know he Googled it. You took away his glory moment. Okay? No, 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 I didn't. He just, just, just proved how sad <laughs> that some students. No, just kidding. Also, coincidentally, 1945, it would have taken like 30 minutes to look that answer up. What was it, 45? I, I said 47. <laughs> Whatever, yeah. I just think because you can Google it now and you would have to go to the library and check out a book or two, read through it, do something. Exactly. Exactly. Pull the scrolls resourceful. out. I'm resourceful. Resourceful. Okay, that what, that what you call it, huh? All right. So at any rate, that's the point of all this. This is why we do these things. So when I say, when you know, and this comes out in every single class I teach, right? Because we don't just want to build something that works. We want to build something that lasts. And, and last means that it doesn't take a lot to fix it. It takes as little as possible to fix it or to change it. So anything we can do as far as maintainability, that includes things, <coughs> dumb things, I mean, put air quotes around the word dumb, dumb things like naming your controls in an understandable way. So you don't have to sit there scratching your head saying, Gee, was text box one the name or text box one the email address? It's called text name, text email. It takes you a second to go and make that change, but it will it will add um, it, it will subtract a lot of time as far as maintainability goes. Um, there's a there's a, a um, there, there's a great book in a library about web design called Don't Make Me Thick. The idea is that a web pages should be straightforward enough where you don't have to study the page to figure out what you need to do. And there's no way we can eliminate the thinking out of programming. So I can't say the same thing for programming. But I can say, make your code maintainability so some of the things are obvious and you can spend your thinking time on the important stuff, not trying to figure out what label one is. All right. We'll come back to this. This is why we design databases the way we do, right? This is why we name variables the way we do. I mean, this, effect, this impacts every single thing we do. All right, so I put that here, and I'm going to make it to show the hint. Now, how do I do that? That's something I have to do via code, right? Because right now it's set to invisible. So if I were to run this, it would be invisible. And I have a button to show it, but that button isn't connected to anything. All right? So how do I connect <coughs> the code to this? Double -click. I can double click it. And that should take me in the code behind file. Again, remember, the way we're creating web pages, every single one of them is going to have the ASPX page, which is the ASP.NET controls and HTML and CSS. It's also going to have the... Um, code behind file, which is the server-side behavior that we want to implement. So what do we want to do when, for example, this form is submitted and this button is clicked? So what we want to do now is we want to panel, panel one dot, do we say panel one equals true? Okay. Work with me here. Oh. All right. Why don't we say panel one true? Because that's what I said. Right. Because panel one is the object. Panel one is a thing that has a bunch of characteristics about it. It has a width. It has a height. It has a background color. It has a CSS class. It has a whole bunch of things about it. What about that? What property, what characteristic about it do you want to change? We want to change the visibility of it. So therefore, we're going to say panel one dot visible equals true. Oops. Visible. I think. I think it was a lowercase. I don't think it was named panel one. It's not called panel one, right? Panel hint one. Yeah. Yeah, 
Yeah, there you go. Panel hint one dot visible equals true. All right. So now when we run this, we can show the hint. <clears throat> So I can go in here, and initially that's going to be invisible. If I click on Show Hint, boom, it shows me the hint underneath it. Wouldn't it be nice to hide the hint? I'm not sure in the case of the quiz where that's really relevant, but if you think about, like, let's say you had a page that had um, examples, code examples, and you want to be able to show and hide those code examples, or or something. <coughs> How could we make it so this button serves two purposes? It shows or hides depending on whether it's visible or not. If statement. If statement. An if statement. All right. An if statement where? Within the, the click event. Within the click event. Right. So what I could do is I could say. If panel hint one visible equals true. Do you want it false? Because if it's invisible, then you want it to go visible when you click the button. If it's visible, you want it to go invisible. Yeah, I could I could write the you could write the if statement either way. It's just oh. a matter of what's going to be the true part and what's going to be the false oh, part. Okay. I just figured we already had panel that visible and true risk. No, you you're way worse than him. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, it's, it's it's dad ears, I think. You know, people talk about mom ears, but I think I have dad ears, you know. All right. Now we're gonna we're gonna run this. We're gonna see how it works, and we're gonna come back and we're going to look closer at this if statement. All right. So now I go and run this. Click on the button. It shows the hint. Click on the button again. It hides the hint. <coughs> Hmm. What's wrong with this picture, UI wise? It doesn't show hide. It doesn't change the text. It doesn't change the text of that. So I could make the button say show slash hide text. No, you wanted to say hide. Text. Yeah, or I could change the text to say show when it's going to show it, hide when it's going to hide it. All right. So how would I do that? Button, hint one, <coughs> and we have to get, we have to know what the attribute is, and we have to know where the period is on the keyboard <laughs> first, but after that, we have to look. And usually, usually after you do these a while, you start to get used to this, right? And it's like, you look, say, oh yeah, it's text, all right? Equals. If we're going to make it false, we're going to we want it to say show hint. Do you want to take? No, I want it to be show. Right. If it's invisible, the button will make it visible. So I want to show the hint. Yeah, you had a question. Do you want to, since we're doing it like this now, do you want to go back into the HTML side of it and erase the text out of the lower right hand side? You know what I mean? Or will it fight each other if you don't get rid of the. No. Because, yeah, because that's, think of that as being the initial value. Okay. When the page loads the first time, the hint is invisible and it says, um, Show hint. Would you almost want to just leave it in there in case the browser, for whatever reason they're using, doesn't support this? That way it has a default backup? Well, let, let, let's back up. Um, and, and keep in mind, this code, the way it's written now, 
only runs when the button is clicked, so it would not show an initial value. Now, we could get around that if we wanted to. I'm not going to talk about that today. Now, your question, and you asked an excellent question. What about browser compatibility? What if the, there are browsers that don't support this code? Anyone have a comment on that question? Pardon me? Switch to PHP. Can you force it to, or, or set in some type of tag that will help? Well, what the browser doesn't support PHP then? You can try to find a patch for it. All right, all your answers are wrong. <laughs> and they're not just wrong, they're spectacularly wrong. All right. And, and and I'm not saying this to goof on you. All right. So so don't don't think don't don't get too sensitive here. All right. You guys have all had Huffman, you know that he's probably a lot rougher than I am, right? A lot meaner than I am. All right. But the answer to the question is is that the data is an absurd question. Because browsers don't run ASP.NET code. Browsers don't run PHP code. Browsers consume what? HTML, CSS, JavaScript. Famous diagram. Client, internet, server. The ASP.NET stuff, the interactivity with the database stuff, goes on here. Client makes a request, gets a response. What form the response is? HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. All the magic, all the ASP.NET stuff happens here. So therefore, it's an absurd statement to say the browser not being compatible with ASP.NET. All right? Browsers don't need to be compatible with ASP.NET. They don't deal with ASP.NET. Now, there is a little issue with browser compatibility, and that is, it doesn't have anything to do really with ASP.NET. It has to do with the fact that that's, these ASP.NET scripts are creating HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So they're your co-writer for your web page. You have to make sure your co-writer behaved him or herself and generated the HTML correctly <coughs> so that it is cross-browser compatible. So yes, there is the issue of cross-browser compatibility, but not with ASP.NET code, but rather with the code that the ASP.NET generates, the HTML. So you still got to test across multiple browsers, all right? Um, but there's no real issue as far as um, the, the browser not being compatible with ASP.NET. There was always a question when I used to give exams in this class. So it was always like the first question, you know, what are the browser compatibility issues associated with running ASP.NET code? And the answer is, well, there really isn't any because browsers don't run ASP.NET code. The server does. Well, I appreciate, I appreciate the leading questions that allow me to lecture on something that I probably should cover anyhow. So, well done. All right, so now we're toggling the button. Why am I doing Why am I With C Sharp, you can change any aspect of the page that you want, any aspect of the controls. It's just a question of what is the control that you want to change and what property do you want to change about it. Now, again, in some cases, like after you do this, you'll find that a lot of controls have a text property. Text box has a text property. A, um, a um, um, label has a text property. Uh, you know, a lot of controls have text properties. So you'll get to know that one right off pretty well. And the ones that you use a lot, um, you know, you, you'll, you'll get to learn and get to know those pretty well. There's always 
going to be a case though where you, you know you, there's something you haven't dealt with before or something you can't recall, that's where all the resources that I talked about in your first assignment comes in. If you want to see, you know, what are the properties of a text box? So just go to Google and type in ASP.NET text box properties. And we can go, and again, this is MSDN, so it's straight from Microsoft. And we can see really essentially everything about a text box. Yes? Pardon me? Within Visual Studio? No, I have not. View? Oh, there we go. All right. Excellent. So it's built right in. Okay. Yeah, maybe, maybe not. So that is a tool apparently you can you can download and you, you can then have the, the help essentially the help right there with you. All right. So the point is again, this is an object oriented world. The question of how to do something usually comes down to what is a property that I need to manipulate. And remember, we can set those properties two ways. We can set those properties through the property window, and that gives it an initial value. Um, we can also change it through the code. <clears throat> also remember that these things maintain state. What do I mean by maintain state? I mean it remembers the choice um, or, or it remembers the, the, the state, all the properties about it from submission to submission to submission. So in other words, if I run this, And let's say I, I click show hint. All right, I see the hint. The hint is visible. And I type in 1968. And I submit answer. It says it's wrong. It displays a little icon. But the hint is still showing. Why is the hint still showing? Because I remembered, or and I'm sorry, not I remembered. It remembered to because that button was clicked and I set the visibility property, it's still going to have that visibility property. It remembers all the properties associated with it. So as many times as I put it in, until I hide it, then it will stay hidden each time. All right. Okay, let's put some validation on this. Before we do that, one thing I want to verify by looking at the source code. Remember, if you create an event like I did by double clicking on it, be sure that it has created this on click equals. That's really what ties together the button and the code. In other words, if this is missing, even though this method is called button hint one click, if I get rid of that, it doesn't really know that, hey, this is the code I want to run when the user clicks on that button. So if I go and run this, <coughs>
Yes. Represents the click of it. Hand load the button. All right. So, I mean, I can click that all day then. Even though my code is right, this button is not linked to call that code when it gets clicked. All right. So, let me go put that <coughs> so it's not broken. Wrong place. So now we're, we're good to go. Let's put some validation on this. All right. I'm going to first put, and I could, I could approach this validation a couple different ways. I could put a compare validator on it. What's a compare validator do? It, it, it yeah. Normally, it compares one variable to another, but this is where I don't really like how they implemented this. It also allows you to compare a control with a certain data type. All right. So in other words, when would you want to con compare two controls with each other? Well, if you were putting in a starting date and an ending date, you want to make sure the ending date was after the starting date. Or if you were putting in um, a range of, of dollar amounts, let's say you were looking for a house, in using a, a, a realtor's online search. And you'd say, I want to look at a house between $100,000 and $120,000. Well, you better make the larger number second, otherwise it's not going to do the range right. <clears throat> um, so that's one use of a compare validator. Or like if you enter a password, your password has to match. All right? Um, but another use of the compare validator, which I'll put on... here is I can compare that with and I say control to validate I only have one I have what kind of Validation I'm doing. That's the operator. Here's all the standards. Equal to, not equal to, greater than, greater than or equal to, blah, 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 blah. The last one is the one that we're interested in in this case. And that is a data type check. And the data type is, it needs to be, in this case, I'll, I'll make it a, an integer. Right, because um, I wouldn't want to put in, you know, 1969.7 or something like that. I want, I want the year. All right. And it, I, I would be good, by the way, as a usability issue. This isn't really a technical issue, but do remember we're <coughs> web developers and we want to make sure our pages are understandable. When did Apollo 11 land on the moon? A better way to phrase that question, if I'm expecting the answer to be 1969, is in what year did Apollo 11? We'll look at alternate ways of doing that in a, in a minute here. All right? All right, so I can run this. And I can say science, submit answer. It tells me I must enter a number. All right. But if I leave it blank, blank it takes it. Why is that? Because a data type check does not imply that the field is required. What it means is, if I enter a value, in this case, it better be an integer. And again, we talked about the reason why you might want to do this. If you had, for example, uh, a field for age that was optional, where it says you can enter your age if you want to, but you don't have to. All right? You might want to allow people to leave it blank, but if they do enter a value in, 
you want to make sure that that value is proper. This is a little bit of thinking ahead, but a lot of times this will correspond to a database table. And there may be a field in the database in the customer table for age, let's say, <coughs> or the year you were born or something like that. Now you might be allowed to have that field be null, so you, you, you might be able to save the row without putting anything in that field, but if you put something in it, it has to be a valid date or a valid year or something like that. So in this case, I'm actually going to have a second validator, which is a required field validator. All right, let me let me let me Sorry, do it again. I, no, that's okay. That's terrible from back here. No, that, that's I, okay. I, I do it the first time. All right, I click and hold it. Uh -huh. I drag it to where I want it, and then release. Did, how does it know where to go, though? Well, that's a good <laughs> question. It, it 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 knows to go where I where I actually physically move the cursor, and in this case. I put uh, my cursor was between the text box and the first validator, okay. so it knows so, to put it there. So did the first validator, did you technically click and drop it inside the, the text box? No, I, I, I put it uh, right to the right of the text box. Okay, but it knows to go to the text box. Right? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll see it when I. Well, well, let's let's back up because that raises a good point. It knows to go to the text box because I put in the control to validate as being that text box. Uh, okay. All right. That's what ties the text box to the validator. So technically, you could put that anywhere. You I could put that anywhere. In fact, probably not today, but, but at some point we'll talk about how you can have like a little validation summary where it shows a list of all the errors. And that validation <laughs> summary might be away from where the actual text fields are. All right. This is one of those layout kind of issues that can get dicey, in which case I would say, go to the source view, all right? And then you can, you can rearrange it however you want. So I'm going to go put a required field validator, and I'm going to say, must enter a value. And I'm going to tie that to Control to validate. Text answer. Or do you want to just say a year? A year. Must a year. That probably would be more descriptive. And I'll say that for this one too. Must enter a year. If I really want to be nice to my users, I'll go and change this to say, in what year. And then I can go in here and put a tooltip in here. Or I could put an initial value for the text in there that they'd have to overwrite. I don't really like that because you'd have to go and um, type over it. You'd have, to, you'd have to type over it and you'd have to get rid of the Y's. So we'll do it with just a tooltip. So there, the tooltip says enter YYYY. I type in 1960 and submit answer, and it tells me I'm wrong. Show hint. What about the big gap between there? What is that from? There didn't used to be that big of a gap. 
the validation controls, and how can I fix that? There's a property for that, all right? If I ever ask a question in class and you have no idea what the answer is and you can't Google it quick enough, all right, yell out, there's a property for that. Or yell out maintainability. And if, you're, if, if, if you develop enough judgment to know when the one answer is good and when the other answer is good, then you got like 70% of this class down, all right? So, yes, this is an object-oriented <coughs> world. If the question is, how do I make it such that this control acts this way, there's probably a property for that. In this case, to be a little more precise, the property is display. I can say display dynamic. Static simply means that it will always, um, always take up the amount of space that you've given for that error message, where dynamic means that um, it will only take up that space if there's an error message there. So now I go in and Notice that there is no, oops, there is no um, air message, so the buttons are right next to each other. Now, watch this. This is your first unofficial quiz of the term. All right. I click show hint. It's not showing the hint. There's a property for that. There's a property for that. Yay! <laughs> There's a property for that. What is happening here? It's not letting you um, close <coughs> the validation. Right. Both of these are submit buttons, right? Both of these are submitting to the server because it's server-side code that's showing and hiding that panel. All right? Therefore... It has to make it to the server before the server-side code can run. This validation is run both on the client side and on the server side. So if it runs on the client side and a validation error is detected, then, um, what do I want to say here? Um, then, um, it won't submit it to the server so that the code can show and hide that. And there indeed is a property for that. What is the property for that? That I don't know. I just know there is one. For the uh, button, it's like don't validate or something. Right. Like that. Well, I wouldn't say it's stupid. It's stupid. No, it causes validation. How's that stupid? <laughs> and I'll say false. All right, so now if I go and run this, I click show hint, I see the hint even though there's nothing in the box. Now, watch this. Not that anyone would do this, right, because if you got it right, you know, but let's say I type in 1969 and get it right. Submit answer. It says it's correct. Let's say I type in <coughs> Notice what happened. It still thinks I'm right because that didn't get cleared out. And yeah. I'm not right because I didn't enter a year. That would actually be a tricky one to solve. It's a tricky one to solve because with client-side validation, the code to clear out that error message would have to run on the client. So I would have to do this via JavaScript. All right, and 
Um, I don't really, really want to get into that right now. But that's why there's that little quirk in there. Yes? You couldn't um, add some code behind to the submit button to change the properties to hidden and OK, let's try that. Let's try that. Let's go. Let's go in. Here's a code behind. <laughs> no, we could because we could do this. We could put that at the beginning of this script. As soon as it's clicked, now, what's the problem with this? Any idea? Looks reasonable. Like it goes from false Pardon me? You're not going to have a text on your button. Okay. <clears throat> well, let's see. Let's see if it works, first of all. Then we can play the job of weatherman, right? Because a weatherman never can predict what it's going to be, but after it happens, they can always explain why we got eight feet of snow when they said it was going to be 70, right? Don't jinx it. Don't jinx it, right. I'm actually looking forward to the snow, believe it or not. I'm looking forward to the summer. I heard it's supposed to be here in a few more weeks. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right, so I type in... 1969 tells me I'm correct. I block this out. All right, so I'm going to get a validation error when I do this. But I have code in the button that's going to hide that stuff, maybe. So I go and click that. Validation killed it. Again, it's important to understand the way the client and the server is interacting here. The validation is running on the client side. Therefore, you can do whatever you want here in the server side code and it's not going to make a hill of beans worth of difference. All right, Because this code never runs unless the page has been passes validation on the client side. So the page is not submitted until it passes validation in other words. So it doesn't matter what this is. All right. So then you'd have to write a clear button or something like that. Um, I would never write a clear button. I would write JavaScript that when that button was press, pressed, I could I could invoke a JavaScript function to clear out the 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 HTML for that. So that would be the approach I would take if if so I really that was run before the validation. Yeah, I would I, I would make sure it ran either before or during the validation, yeah. or Well, yeah, I would make sure it ran before the validation. All right. I believe there's an on-client click property where I could create and invoke a JavaScript function. If anyone has ever, if anyone has a situation where they want to do that, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it individually. Now, let's go back and let's look at this if statement. And because I'm obsessive, I gotta correct the spelling of year. All right. Notice the way this if statement works. Let's take a minute to review the way if statements work. If text answer dot text equals 1969, let's just look at that line. First of all, I have the word if. That means it's a conditional statement. All right. That means within parentheses, there's going to be evaluated to a Boolean. It's going to be evaluated to a Boolean. All right. What does that mean, evaluated to a Boolean? It means that the server is going to look at that and evaluate if the statement is true or if the statement is false. So only two possibilities with an if statement, true or false. So. If the value of the text box 
equals 1969, all right, then the if statement is true and we're going to do this stuff within this brackets. That's where the, the, the curly brackets are show containment, show that this is a block of stuff that we're going to do. And when do we do this? We do that if that condition is true. If it's false, we do this other stuff. You don't always have to have a false. You could, there, there could be some case where you have an if statement um, that has something that you want to do if it's true, but if, there's, if it's false, then you don't need to worry about it. All right. Now, I'm going to go in here, and I'm going to break this. Because you're not seeing double here. That's two equal signs. All right. One last thing before I go on to that. Why is 1969 enclosed in quotes? Because it's a string of <coughs> literal. In other words, I am actually looking for a value of 1969, those four characters. All right. Interestingly enough, if I put spaces after 1969, I'd get a wrong answer. But we won't talk about that right now. There's ways that we could, we could fix that, but we won't worry about that now. Yeah, trim it. Whoops. If I said this, I get an error. Why? Because 1969 is an integer. All right? And it can't compare a text to an integer because that text could be anything. And 1969 is an integer. So I have to put this around because that is a string. I have to put this around to indicate it's a string literal. Why can't I do this? What does it think correct is? No, it doesn't think it's a string. Oh, there. It thinks it's a variable because there's no quotes around it. So you put quotes around string literals. When you have a string of characters, that has to be a specific value. All right. When you're using a variable, you don't put quotes around it. So there might be, for example, a variable called correct. Maybe I'm keeping track of how many correct the student has, in which case I would not put around uh, uh, quotes around it in that case. All right. So let me break this. And I'm going to break it by... putting an equal sign there, and that gives me a compile error, which is good. All right, you need a double equal sign. Let me think of another way of breaking this. All right, I hope you didn't see what I did. Hope you don't realize what I did. All right, let me run this now. So I'll go here and type in the correct answer, 1969, click Submit Answer. It's going to tell me I'm wrong. What? It's not right. That's, I mean, that is right. That's the right answer. Yeah, I'm testing to see if the text box equals 1969. What's wrong with my code? That's an L, That's an L right. We know that. Oh, because oh, oh. it's looking for a series of numbers All right. and numbers. Well, you know that. Right, you you know that because you you know you're perceptive enough to see that, but there might be other kind of errors that are a little less obvious. For example, maybe I got the true and the false part of the if statement wrong. I switched those two blocks accidentally. And of course, it's not marked. And of course, it's not marked because it's not a syntax error. Yes. Why well, didn't the validation catch it? It's only looking for integers. I typed in 1969. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So the validation of the control succeeded. All right, because I typed in an integer. What failed was comparing that to L969. What I want to demonstrate, though, is there'll be problems that are more confusing than this. 
all right? What I encourage all my students to do is develop a set of tools to troubleshoot and problem solve. That's one of the greatest skills that you can develop, all right? Because inevitably something is going to go wrong. And developing good troubleshooting skills will allow you to find it quickly as opposed to thrashing and just not making any progress. So, one way to solve this problem would be to stare at it. <laughs> All right? To stare at it. My guess is if you didn't see it within 10 seconds of staring at it, you probably never will. <laughs> right? Or you could try to start doing things. Hmm. Maybe my if statement is backwards. Let me copy all these and put them in the false. Let me copy all these and put them in the true. Or maybe I'm using the wrong property here. The point is, is another thing people do is take wild shots at things, thinking or hoping that maybe they'll hit on the right combination of things and boom, they'll have the right answer. Yeah. You could throw in a message box, that's true, but probably more powerful than that is to run it through the debugger. All right? What the debugger does is it lets you sort of x-ray this script as it's running and see exactly what the server is doing. All right? So how do I debug this? Well, I can click here in this little area. There. Click there, and that sets what's called a breakpoint. All right. Remember, you could have a gigantic program with all kinds of C sharp instructions here. Typically, if you're troubleshooting something, you're troubleshooting one specific area. So, by putting a breakpoint in here, you're saying, "Hey, this is where things start to go south." Near as I can tell. All right. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a breakpoint in there, and I'm going to let the server stop and show me what it's doing every step of the way. So, now I have that breakpoint set. I'll click on debug. I'll type in 1969. I'll click submit. And it doesn't simply continue and do that. It goes into x-ray mode at that breakpoint. And I can see exactly what lines of code are being executed. All right? So, if I hover over that, it tells me that that's a text box. If I hover over the text property, it tells me that the answer that I typed in the text is 1969. Now, the mere fact, and again, this might be a little hard to see, but the fact that these things are right next to each other might be enough to give you the clue that, hey, this character looks a little different than that. I know that would be difficult to tell on the projector, but viewing it on the computer screen is a little more obvious. All right, so that in itself, by just looking to say, hey, I think that is comparing 1969 with 1969, but by putting it up there, you can actually see the values. You can then also step through the code. And I'm going to step into, and that will show me each step of the way. And I can either step into to, through the menu, or I can hit F11. This is showing me that it did not take the top branch of the if statement. It took the bottom branch of the if statement. So it's not as though the if statement is right and these instructions are wrong. That if statement is not evaluating correctly. And by F11, 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 again, I can look at these values. It shows me down here the, the values of the variables. Keeping in mind that some of these things are objects and as such have a bunch of properties associated with them. And then it finished that script, so 
the debugger pops out and I see the page. The debugger, you know, practice it. And we'll be going over examples um, in class of, of different things you can do in a debugger. But be aware of it. Be aware of how you can set breakpoints and be aware how you can trace through code. I can just about guarantee that if you, if you bring a problem to me and you ask me, you know, this calculation isn't working correctly or whatever, I can just about guarantee that my question to you will be, have you run it through the debugger? What has the debugger shown you? All right. The idea is, is we don't want to just thrash at a problem. All right. We want to take a systematic approach to testing and debugging. And we'll talk more about testing um, at some point of, of uh, the class, but we want to take a systematic approach. We don't want to simply stare at it, and we don't want to simply just start changing stuff until we get the right magical response. All right, questions. Next time I promise, I alluded to doing it this time, but next time I promise we will cover things like drop downs and radio buttons and all that. You are welcome to try to do some of these things on your own, all right? Because remember, it's all a matter of properties. It's all a matter of getting the right property to do the things that you want to do. All right. Is that going to be, because the next homework I drop is with the drop downs. Are we going to do the class, because it's due Thursday, so Thursday are we going to cover drop downs? Sure. Yes. And I'm sure they're simple, but. Yeah. If it requires more time, yeah. then, then I'll extend it. Yeah, I figured it was probably pretty simple. Yeah. It's the ASP. I don't really know this. It's a mix of things. Yeah, it's, I wouldn't say per se that the majority is one versus the other because there's a lot of controls. Um, the next big set of controls that we'll get will relate to database interactivity, and those won't come for a while. So for a while, we're going to be working on the code behind DevOps. Yeah, yeah, exactly.